the voice. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to History Matters. And I will confess, so does iced tea. <laughs> I didn't have time to make coffee today. Um, today we are talking, uh, as advertised, uh, in advance, only briefly in advance, but still in advance. We're talking about we, uh, the grand we of American society. But before we plunge into that topic, I will turn to Grace, who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everyone. I'm Grace Leatherman. I'm the Executive Director of the National Council for History Education. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. Um, Joanne, thank you again for being with us to explore important themes throughout history that remain relevant today. We're just delighted to have you here for History Matters and so does coffee. If you enjoy this, please check out our other offerings at ncheteach.org. And you can see more episodes with Joanne at ncheteach.org slash conversations. So we hope you'll join us for that. Please participate in the chat. But if you have something, that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a question you would like me to ask Joanne, please put it in the Q&A. And it's very helpful if you do that. Um, and I will, after Joanne speaks, I'll make sure to ask her your questions. Thank you so much. Take it away, Joanne. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so, do, okay, that helps. Um, okay, so welcome. And I will say, because I will forget it within a nanosecond, this is our 107th episode, 107, uh, admirable. Uh, so, okay, so I wanted to talk about we. Um, I certainly have not, uh, this is not certainly the first time I've talked about it here. I talk about it all the time. I realize that some of you are probably out there thinking, oh, what a shock, <laughs> just talking about we. Um, I have friends who um, make fun of me for the frequency with which I bring this up, um, but it's for good reason, right? Because um, I think generally speaking, uh, we are, are having a kind of non-we moment uh, in which people's sense of, um, let's just say for now, community uh, is distinctive and, and in many ways not very broad and certainly in some ways warped. Um, what brought it to my mind this week, um, which I suppose uh, might be obvious, is the lifting of the mask mandate um, and people on airplanes immediately cheering and ripping their masks off, um, which on the one hand, I understand because we're not enjoying wearing masks. On the other hand, um, can you imagine being on that airplane and um, assuming the rules of that game uh, and that you got on there and that you felt relatively safe and maybe you are immunocompromised or maybe you have someone at home who is and then suddenly no one's masked. Um, so that certainly raised for me um, this ongoing question about who is the we uh, that we're thinking about these days or why isn't there one? Uh, how are people thinking about the sort of broader us of America and American society? Uh, and what can looking at the past and talking about this in the past help us to, how can that help us to better understand where the heck we are today? Now, it's a topic when you're talking about we, I will say right at the outset, it's a topic that, um, <laughs> boy, is it complicated because when I, in one sense, when I'm talking about it, I'm speaking in a very sweeping way about Americans thinking about other Americans, and that's a, a broad understanding. But of course, in a more specific uh, and equally, if not more important way, if you're talking about we, you're talking about inclusion and exclusion, right? So who is included in some people's we, uh, it might be very selective, right? Maybe, maybe uh, are non-white people included in someone's we? Um, are only wealthy people included in, in someone's we? So in other words, the community, or even broader than that, society that people think that they belong to and are responsible for, that can be limited, very limited indeed, right? So that's another level of we, a complication of we that also needs to be part of this conversation. So in a way, I'm kind of talking about it on, on two levels. What I wanna start by talking about is the most sweeping level, which is um, how do we think about who we are um, as Americans? Um, and this is, it's, it's in a sense, an abstraction that has a deep meaning, deep meaning. And so it can't be dealt with just as an abstraction on the one hand, on the other hand, it really is one. So if you go all the way back to the most obvious places to go, if you're thinking about we, right, is we the people, 
<laughs> of course, how can I not say that? Uh, the, the Declaration and the Constitution. Um, you know, the Declaration comes up, up with this all men are created equal idea, um, which certainly, I mean, it is men, uh, but it's all of them. And yet, you know, although the original draft did mention slavery, um, all men are not in the United States being taken uh, as being equal. Uh, even if they're created equal, they're not equal after that point in the United States or anywhere that allows the institution of slavery to be in force. So from our very first founding-ish document, the Declaration of Independence, there's a complicated we. Um, move on to the Constitution, and that's equally, if not more complicated. Uh, now it's we, the people of the United States, and among the things that we the people do in signing onto that document is, um, well, I don't wanna say encourage, allow for and institutionalize uh, slavery into the American system uh, by not necessarily using the word slavery or the word slave, but very clearly making it obvious that enslaved people are part of the count of representation and thus slavery is at least in that sense being endorsed, accepted, allowed, not eliminated and not attacked. So from the very beginning, um, we the people has been complicated and continues to be. Now that said, it's also true that if you go back to the founding period and look at how um, particularly the politically minded in that period were thinking about the people, um, they thought that the power and meaning of that phrase, the people, had a very different meaning in a republic versus a monarchy. So one of the things that uh, in their mind made a republic distinctive from a monarchy is the power and centrality of public opinion. Now I've, I've talked before and it actually might have been now in the distant past. I'm at this point, 107 episodes that I, you know, I'll think of a topic and I'll think, have I talked about this before? Have I talked about it twice before? I have no idea. And I have to keep going back and looking at past episodes, all handily archived if you'd like to catch them, um, to try and figure out if I have. Um, and I'm sure I have talked about uh, public opinion in some way or another, uh, partly because it's just something that always has interested me. The idea that um, a Republican, small r, form of government relies on public opinion to a greater degree than a monarchy certainly does. But who is the public and how do you get their opinion are really big questions that are being debated and improvised and acted on and um, argued over uh, in the time period, the, the founding period, the period I'm talking about right now in a way that I find really profoundly interesting, right? And, and I'm sure I've talked before about people sitting in elite guys sitting in taverns to collect public opinion. You know, we're like looking to see what newspapers people are reading, Federalist or Republican, so they can collect public opinion, um, trying to figure out what the public thinks because it really matters. And it's one thing to know that and acknowledge that again in an abstract institutional kind of a way. It's another thing when that boils down to um, reality. And obviously um, there has never been a moment in American history when there hasn't been debate, argument, strife, conflict, um, or at least big questions about what we the people means, who are the people, what kind of power do they have or not. That's forever. So it's abstract, it's very real, and it goes all the way back. Uh, to, and from the very beginning, this assumption that it's central, it's part of what makes America distinctive. It's part of why um, I'm always, uh, on Twitter saying, you know, people need to, they don't understand that when they come together and really speak up that they have power, um, regardless of, of what people are claiming or allowing or changing, that still remains true. Uh, but still, uh, you have an abstract level of understanding we, you have a very ground level reality way of understanding we. Now, this brings me to the word and the idea of community. Um, which is slightly different, right? Community is kind of the people who you understand as being your, it doesn't have to be geographic, right? It doesn't, you don't have to be near them in proximity, but, but kind of your people, right? Your community. Um, and it, it, generally speaking, is gonna be smaller than the broad sweeping we, um, but it really matters. And certainly in early America, like community mattered a lot. As a matter of fact, it mattered so much that uh, the framers and other founder folk and politically minded people in that time period who were thinking about 
um, trying to create a national government of some kind that was going to be stronger than the Articles of Confederation, they assumed it would be really, really hard to get people to essentially buy into this larger whatever the heck it was going to be because what mattered to them most was their local community, their state before a colony. It was always the local, Hamilton says this a number of times, it's always the local that will have precedence. People will always move towards the local, have feelings towards the local, protect the local to a much greater degree than they will ever think about anything broader than that. So he, as someone who really wanted a much stronger national government, that's part of his logic, right? Well, there's no way people are gonna sign on to this uh, and be really loyal to it. So we need the system itself to um, sort of encourage people's behavior and, and feelings and loyalties in such a way that it will, uh, if not strengthen, at least preserve um, the new national government. So community was pretty important in this time period and was taken as a strong political force. Right, that's the real we, that's, that's the ultimate we. Now, one of the things that helped lead to the Constitutional Convention was um, a, a sort of crashing lesson about we, and that is the American Revolution, a war and a crisis, um, did what wars and crises do, which is bring people together in a real you know, shared sense of cause. Right? That's, that's what wars and crises often, not always, and we'll come back to that, um, often do. Uh, and so that was fine. And you know, there was what, what um, some have called in the time period and scholars afterwards have called you know, the rage militaire, right? Everyone's like, yeah, we're together. We're fighting the cause. And then the revolution ends. And then you move into the 1780s. And basically, all of the states turn back in on themselves. And they're not really interested anymore in the we, right? Why should they be? The we is, you know, it's out there. You have the Articles of Confederation. You have a, a confederation government. You, you, there is still a we, uh, but it's a confederation we. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a strong national we. Um, it's like a league, almost like a league of, of little nation states. Um, and so the, the surprise, the unpleasant surprise of the 1780s is that when the war ends, everyone just turns away from each other and goes, back into their corners. And eventually, by towards the end of the 1780s, you get things like um, Shea's rebellion in Massachusetts. Uh, again, it's local. Um, rebellion of people um, protesting against uh, a variety of things, including court fees, shutting down courts. Um, it is an, you know, an actual rebellion. Uh, but the unpleasant surprise of that for some people is that there uh, does not appear to be a way to shut it down. People are afraid of it spreading. And um, people, you know, ask the Confederation Congress, like, hey, there's like a rebellion happening in Massachusetts. And the Confederation Congress basically says, yeah, no, we're sorry. <laughs> like, we don't have money really to apply to that. Uh, it kind of is their problem and not our problem. Uh, we will not directly address that. And Shea's rebellion is quashed in some ways by what amounts to a private army, right? People put money together to create some kind of an armed force that can quiet down what's going on in Massachusetts. That's the kind of thing that people who wanted a national government can point to and say, hey, like not only is the revolution over and, and that wonderful we, that, that American we we seem to have is gone, but when you have this rebellion happening in a state, no one cares enough to even step forward and do anything about it on a national level. So that, you know, for those who are already nationally minded, and that includes Hamilton, um, that includes George Washington, and it includes a lot of people who were at headquarters uh, or had anything to do with the running of the war effort. That was, for some people, that ended up being a kind of national minded machine because what they saw at headquarters at the center of the war effort was that the, the Continental Congress and then the Confederation Congress did not have the power really to do very much at all in running the war effort. So people like Hamilton and Washington come out of that experience thinking, eh, and then the 1780s confirms them in this idea that something needs to come along and be created that's stronger. Shays Rebellion and things like it for the nationally minded, it's like, ha, like there you can see it, right? There's an open rebellion of some kind and there's nothing we can do about it. We must have a stronger national government. And if you look in the um, letters and writings of that moment in time, you see lots of 
um, fear and anxiety about what would happen if there isn't some kind of a stronger government. So there you see a moment in which, um, among other things, you know, there, there's a, a really little we, uh, and there's not much of a, of a national one happening to shut down that kind of rebellion that helps push things forward into creating the Constitutional Convention and a stronger government, which in one way or another, even though this would not have been the way they put it at the time, by creating a stronger government is, is going to sort of engraft you know, some kind of a we on the nation at large, right? Well, now there's this big national government that um, you are also loyal to, right? Your local government and this broader government that is directly connected to you and not just connected to your state or your state government, you are addressed with two, that government's connected to you personally as well, which gets us back to federalism and divided sovereignty. But one way or another, it changes the we and it's meant to change the we in addition to creating what people who supported it would have considered a, a working, functional, powerful enough government. And the 1790s in one way or another, th there's a lot of crises in the 1790s. I love writing about that decade in part because it's so fascinating because um, there are really fundamental things being worked out. Uh, and some of them are really just the basics of um, what is a democratic government, small d, democratic government, how does that operate and what kind of rights do the people have and what what, what does protest look like and how much protest is safe uh, in a republic gets us back to the we and what the we should be doing and what's safe for the we to do. The 1790s in a way uh, is a series of crises and many of them are involved in one way or another with this larger question that we're talking about today, which is who are the we? Like who, who do we feel responsible for? Who do we feel connected to do the people we feel responsible for and connected to feel the same thing back? And what are the implications of that politically, um, I guess you could say even militarily, socially, culturally, it's, it's a huge, huge question, which is easy to not see that way when you're looking back in time, much easier to see today when we're living in the middle of it. Now, um, I will say at this moment, an important point, uh, which is not directly at the center of my argument, but important, enough to be made, which is that the we I'm talking about here is not the same thing as patriotism. Okay, so patriotism, that's a word, <laughs> that's a word that can mean a lot of different things and can be warped uh, into being deployed as a weapon in one way or another. So feeling a, a sense of national identity, feeling a sense, a, a sort of sweeping sense of connection to your country writ large, um, is not necessarily the same thing as patriotism, which can have a broad sweeping meaning, um, but can also be an accusation, right? You're not patriotic because you don't believe in me, which comes to the other half of the we issue. Uh, and that is, you know, I have written down here, like crises are times when people tend to have a really strong sense of a, of a we, a national we. And the revolution was a great example of that. Um, you could say, you know, wars of, do that, um, that 9-11 did that as well, right? Brought people together in, in ways that um, for some of us had, we hadn't really seen in our lifetime necessarily. Um, same thing that presidential assassination, you know, these dire crises typically bring the nation together. It's a shared crisis. However, um, not everyone is included necessarily in those moments of you know, togetherness and national supposed embrace, right? So you go back to um, World War II and you have Japanese internment camps, right? It's like, yeah, we, we the people, America, and you people who we're suspicious of are not being included in the we and we're going to go put you away in camps. Or 9-11, right? Huge sense of crisis. And now we will turn on Arab and Muslim Americans because they're all suspicious or the COVID crisis. And we, it's a crisis that we're dealing with in interesting ways as a people, um, but also involves turning on Asian Americans, right? Like, oh, somehow or other, this is an excuse for me to turn on you too. So um, even crises or wars, which often bring people together in a powerful way, maybe for that very reason, ends up trimming off aspects of the we. In a, in a dire, um, sometimes cruel and dangerous kind of a way. So, um, you know, it brings me back, I see I'm, I'm getting close to the amount of time I have here, brings me back to this larger point, which is um, 
what do you do? How is the how is our current state of we? Um, and what do we do about that? Um, in thinking about this moment and thinking about particularly COVID and the masks and the fact that people are, um, many people at least, are not willing to wear masks because they don't want to wear masks or because freedom or whatever the reason is that they're saying they don't want to wear masks. The fact of the matter is that in making that choice, they are declaring that they don't really care if there's someone amongst their group that is either um, vulnerable or knows someone is intimate with someone who is vulnerable. It's a declaration. It's an anti-we <laughs> declaration. It's like my rights, me, my rights, and you can't take away my rights. And there's the implication, which in this case is false, that by defending your rights, you're somehow defending America. Um, but if you think about that and boil that down, uh, defending America by turning your back on vulnerable Americans doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's just back to the problematic charge of patriotism, that um, it has a meaning, it, it is a fine and wonderful thing, and it can be really deployed in dangerous kinds of ways. Um, there is an American we. The question is, who do people include in it? How do they acknowledge it? How is it uh, reflected or not? in the structure of our society, in our legal system, uh, in our cultural institutions, right? The dreaded thing that no one is supposed to talk about, critical race theory, essentially, that's just asking the question of um, how are the structures of America, institutional political structures, legal structures of America, of the United States, how are they disadvantaging Black Americans? That's it. It's not about um, individuals being accused of being racist. It's just as saying, you know, it, the system itself is problematic for certain people in certain ways. It's obvious it's there and we need to look at it and think about it, right? Because it's not helping the we, right? Or at least you can claim that and understand that if you have a large and inclusive sense of who we Americans are. So some of what we're looking at now and all of these people sort of turning away from others and declaring that their rights matter more than anything else, throw in the mix, you know, all of the really obvious white supremacy that's, that's around us. It's a variety of different kinds of people who are um, stating that there's a really defined group that they are willing to acknowledge as their group, their, their we, uh, above and beyond whatever their local community is, their we is small, uh, defined, and um, really exclusive in a lot of ways. That's what we're watching in a lot of ways right now. And what we're also seeing is that that kind of behavior, which at times at least has had, if nothing else, at least the tinge of being um, bad, negative, bigoted, stereotyped, racist. You can have a whole string of words there about all of the negative ways in which if you're saying none of you people count, only the people I like count, in the past, that has been sometimes problematic to assert, and we're in a moment now where increasingly it's not problematic to assert, and as a matter of fact, people appear to be running for office based on that kind of claim, like, you people, you're my people, and I support you, and I support you and show that you are mine by excluding all of these other people who we all hate together. We're, we're in this moment where um, the we uh, and, and using we as a weapon to exclude people um, I've used this word before here too, right? To, to, to hate farm, to rage farm, um, to get people angry and united with you in part by saying, well, we're together and we're together against them. That's a moment that we're in. And so, um, although as I started out by saying, um, there has always been a, a conflict in American society about who is included and who isn't included and who is advantaged and who is disadvantaged. This is a not new moment, but a certainly distinctive moment in which proudly proclaiming that certain people count and other people don't is part of our ongoing open public debate uh, and that there isn't shame attached to it. As a matter of fact, it's pridefully announced. Um, as a way of declaring your political principles. Um, that's obviously in a variety of different ways, not only problematic, which is a word I realize I use all the time, but dangerous. Because if you're not only saying only I count, but if you're adding to that in your rhetoric, um, ideas such as the, the others, the folks who are not the we are subhuman, 
our um, insects, our rats, our vermin, right? All of the kind of phrasing that um, certainly was used really obviously uh, by Nazis in the past, they, but they do not stand in for all people uh, who've made that kind of uh, assertion, saying not only that it, it's we, our small we versus them, but the them that they're talking about can't even really be considered, right? They're not really even people. So I, you know, heaven forbid, I'm not saying that only certain people count. I'm saying we're the people and all of us, the people, we count. All these other vermin and insects, right? They're, they don't count. How could they possibly be part of the we when they're really basically subhuman? That's the logic of that kind of rhetoric. It's obviously beyond dangerous as a logic. And so I suppose, um, part of what I circle back to at the end, and I often do this, and I've certainly done it many, many times before, talking about propaganda, talking about, and I remind myself of this all the time because I'm like everyone else here, some things are meant to stir you up and make you mad, and they do. Uh, and you have to pause before you respond and think, is someone trying to make me mad, either to benefit themselves or to sort of point to me as you know, crazy, angry person? to always pause and think before emotionally responding to political rhetoric and other kinds of rhetoric that are thrown your way. This is another thing to really pause and think about because I think it's easy to overlook as mere rhetoric, mere words, political falderall, right? Stuff politicians do this all the time because it's effective. It's, it's, it's what you do when you're campaigning, right? You, you, attack other people and call them, you know, vermin, rats, horrible people. We don't need to talk about them. They're all cockroaches, right? No, that like many other things happening right now, that is not mere rhetoric. That's a dangerous kind of a rhetoric with a very specific dangerous kind of a meaning. It's dehumanizing people. It's not only saying we versus them. It's saying human versus subhuman. And that's beyond dangerous. So I mention that here because as with propaganda, I want us all to notice when that's being used and to speak out against it, to not let it slide as though it's like, ah, oh, it's what we expect in politics. No, no, it shouldn't be. It isn't. And combined with the many other um, things happening right now about us and them and who counts and who doesn't count, it's supremely dangerous, supremely dangerous. So as with propaganda, don't let that kind of imagery, don't let that kind of rhetoric, don't let those kinds of suggestions or implications, don't let them go by, right? And don't start howling because I just said like propaganda, like people will say that and they want you to scream. I'm not saying that either, but I'm saying watch for it, keep your eyes open and speak out against it act out against it and expose it for what it is. Now, of course, there are gonna be people who either don't care what it is or actually are really happy with what it is and you can't help that. But you can help in not allowing that to pass by dismissed as unimportant. Um, something else, and I actually maybe we'll even talk about this next week that, that struck me this last week along similar lines is all of this talk about um, masculinity, right? Boom, that, that um, Tucker Carlson, I guess, came out with some video about like men are men, and it, it, it's almost a parody uh, of, of masculinity. And that's the same sort of thing that you might say like, ha, 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 look at them, like being a bunch of goofballs, like man, man, like almost like a Monty Python skit, manly, manly men. Um, no, that's actually, uh, when you link that with fascism, when you link that again with us versus them kind of talk and who counts and who doesn't and what you're entitled to do, to get them out of the picture. That kind of masculine talk needs to be taken seriously, needs to be thought about, needs to be um, not dismissed, if nothing else. So um, I, I think the we is a vital concept and all of these ways in which people try to trim off, not just the edges, but huge sections of it in order to declare who counts and who their we is and thus they're entitled to do whatever it takes to crush out or separate or remove or destroy the subhuman other, it's, it's almost, I almost feel silly for having to say that that's dangerous, but it is. Um, so that's where somehow or other, uh, the whole mask idea with people happily removing their masks and not thinking about the fact that 
millions and millions of vulnerable Americans are now being essentially abandoned. Oh, they're, they're not we, they're them. Um, these are dangerous moments and they're easy as are so many other things to let slip by, um, to not think about implications, to dismiss things as mere rhetoric. Um, and at sometimes uh, in history, uh, at some moments of crisis, rhetoric isn't mere at all. Rhetoric uh, ends up being action. And I think we're at one of those moments where we have to think really carefully about the rhetoric other people use, the rhetoric we use and calling things out for what they are. Okay, I did see mug, 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 mug. So, okay. Um, I, was, I, I was a little, uh, I didn't I quite struggle, but I, I was trying to figure out like, how, how can I use a mug to link myself with what we're talking about today? Um, and I thought maybe like, I'll get my U.S. Capitol mug and it's like, you know, we the people, like the representative body, the people's house. But that just felt like a little bit too much of a handy stretch. So what I came up with was the city club of Idaho Falls. <laughs> and the reason I did is it's community, right? I, I talk about the local and community counting and it does and it should uh, matter supremely. Um, these are the sorts of things that actually should matter. We should all have a sense of community. We don't all right now because we've been um, in, in lockdown or hiding or less social than we normally are. This matters, but so does the broader we as well. So, okay, so that, that's however good or bad you think that link is. I think it's not bad for a mug link with, with we. It's the best I could come up with and I haven't used it in a really long time. So, okay. Uh, but now we turn to Grace because I do not know what that background is. Yeah. Um, as usual, I was noodling around in the Library of Congress <laughs> and I just put in We the People just to see. And this is actually a sculpt, a, um, a public art in Gallup, Arizona, entitled We the People, which I wow. thought was kind of interesting. And I haven't totally figured it out. I've been looking at it. I think the light can kind of shine through it, but it's very interesting, wow. I thought. That's that's very cool. I mean, it it is a wall. It is, and it's near the wall, so it's like it's obviously it's not a totally. Po I mean, it's not a totally positive piece of art. I would say I have again. I haven't totally analyzed it, but I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's that is interesting. Yeah, it's cool looking. It is, and if you if you don't know anything about it and just look at it as it is, it is we the people. <laughs> I just don't know what all the implications are, which now I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm sure someone out there, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, like typing away or whatever. Don't about it, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting and very appropriate. I love the way when you said, I was looking at the Library of Congress with a little roll of your head, because of course, that is what you do. What I do. <laughs> you are that person. Are you interested? This is part of the Carol Highsmith collection. Ah, okay. Who has toured all around the country taking pictures of, of local edifices and sort of just documenting America, so. Now that's interesting. Um, Beth says, are those handholds for climbing? I don't think so. I think they're like giant staples, which again is weird, but I think there's light shining through it. So I think it's 3D. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm definitely curious. Yeah. Um, and it is very cool. So you're getting definitely, people are commenting. Lots, that, lots of ways to think about this. I also like the fact that I said, now it's time to look at Grace's background. And Tom said, bingo. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> if there's anyone here watching who has not been here before, um, our community here plays bingo based on what I say. Uh, and Tom always wins. Tom does always win. And you can win too. But it Tom looks like win. Miranda won today too, I think. Yeah, so there's oh. some variation. Yes. Okay. And it is, it is open to the public, so you two can play bingo. You can play bingo all you want. Okay, so let all us right. move on. Newbie is chuckling and kissing, so he's ready for the conversation too, clearly. So We do have a lot of questions coming in, and if you do have more questions, please put them in the Q&A, and I'd be happy to share them. Um, and so I'll start with Miranda, bingo winner that she is. How can we address <laughs> we when the we of a New York City resident is vastly different than the we of a person in a town of 1,200 in the middle of Illinois? Well, that's true. Um, I mean, this will sound like a cop out and I don't mean it that way. We have multiple we's, right? And you, you have to acknowledge 
account for the fact that you're right. Like that there's someone out in a rural area that has a very different kind of a we, and I'm sitting here in New York City um, with a very huge kind of a we, except that, so on the one hand, that's true. And people living in a much smaller or more rural area have just a very different sense of the world because of the people that they're living among. And, you know, in New York City, you just live in, in such um, complex, in a positive way, a complex uh, society. There's so many different kinds of people um, that that shapes your broader understanding of the world um, and can shape your understanding of who counts and who doesn't. I mean, I suppose I could say like, oh, those people out in the country, what do they know? They're, you know, I, I don't. Um, but I also think we're supposed to have, you know, we often do have a broader we. Um, Americans, you know, can, the, our idea of what America is can certainly be shaped by where we are and the dramatic differences among the people we live within. Ideally speaking, we also have a broader we, right? A sense of who we are as Americans. That's, it's complicated right now in interesting ways and some of them have to do with politics um, and racial issues and gender issues and everything else. But another way in which the American we um, is challenged, uh, and I had notes on this and I didn't end up going into it. Um, one of the interesting things about the pandemic is whether we want to hear it or not, uh, what it teaches is that there are no boundaries. It, it's that we live in an international world, that there are national boundaries ultimately don't exist for a virus, right? We're all interconnected in pretty profound ways. And um, I don't think we really hear that. Uh, and, and I do think, you know, to, to basically say we're all connected so we can be somehow less nationalistic maybe than, than we are in every sense of that word is easy to say and not so easy to do. But, um, you know, in, in a sense, the we, who we are and how we think about it and the levels of we you could kind of say that's one of the first real constitutional problems that was addressed at the federal convention, the constitutional convention, uh, because of questions like this question. Federalism, small f federalism, the idea that um, some the, the local government, the state government is responsible for some things, the national government is responsible to others, that you as an American have two levels of government that you're interacting with, this idea that you can complicate your sense of belongingness and loyalty by having different levels of government that are both there at the same time and that you can deal with them in different ways. On the one hand, it was wonderful and amorphous and it allowed the constitution to get passed, right? Because people were like, scary national government. It's like, no, 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 federal, it's federal, right? States count, it's not scary national government. But on the other hand, that same amorphousness remains a, a, a battleground, right, all the time. Like, should this be something states worry about? Should this be something the national government worries about? But that same conflict and that same, those same big questions um, are built into this question too, which is who, how do we define the we? Um, you know, I, I, I'm actually, I'm not gonna, I was about to say something about monarchies and I'm not because I will say something wrong. I always tell my students not to make sweeping claims uh, unless you've got the data to back it up. But I will say, um, that, that it's a fundamental of um, the United States is uh, how complicated it is to decide who the we is and how the government applies to it. And the fact that there's endless variety, but there also has to be some uniformity and how do you do those things at the same time? Um, you know, I, I think, you know, there have been times in the past when we've been able to look at variety and diversity, um, even if you're not talking about race, but just about geographic area of where people live and how they live and how they make a living. Um, and that, that people understood that as a strength of American society. It should be, right? Um, diversity is a strength and should be seen as a strength um, if you're not scared, right? If you're scared, uh, then you start to wanna only see people who look like you and think like you. Um, so it's, I don't have an absolute answer for that, but I think it's a really good question because it touches on a profoundly American problem from the moment that there was a stronger national government created for the United States. Thank you. 
and for those of you who find these questions fascinating, the, the complicated we, uh, whether or not you're a teacher, you should think about checking out Educating for American Democracy. It's a framework that teachers can use that basically sets out some of these questions. Um, and they, they have things called design challenges where they, they're very good about putting these things, these questions into words and making them accessible to students. So check that out, Educating for American Democracy, EAD. Um, well, you talked about, um, talking a lot about the federal government there and, and the complications. Melissa wants to know, what did um, federalists consider the limits of the national government's power? Um, the limits. I don't think they fully agreed. <laughs> it's part of the answer, right? Um, they certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, they certainly um, wanted the national government to be able to assert power over state governments in some way, right? And so, you know, initially during the federal convention, you have people talking about a national veto of state legislation. Even James Madison kind of bought into that to, to some degree, or governors being able to um, tamp down on things in a way that was more sweeping than it ended up being. Um, the 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 Hamilton, the way he talks about power, the strength of the government. Um, kind of goes along with this idea that it's it's sweeping, but there's a fluidity to it so that not everyone agrees. Hamilton very clearly during the constitutional debate, he talks about essentially channeling things, channeling passions and channeling beliefs and ch uh, channeling ideas, challenging, challenge, channeling is the word I'm looking for here, channeling the way people think so that they're encouraged to think and act in a certain way. So yes, he's, you know, he's very upfront by in saying that people are you know, selfish and self-interested and they think about themselves first all the time. Of course they do, that's what people do. But if you can channel those assumptions in such a way using I, potentially government structures, then you can encourage people to act if not always to think in terms of a, of a broader we. So government power for some federalists was a way of encouraging slash compelling people to think in that kind of a way that, you know, well, there is a big we because we say so, because <laughs> we're the national government. So, uh, you know, you should you should see it that way. But and that's precisely why some of that behavior is, is threatening or challenging. Um, an anecdote comes to mind, which I always love because it shows how um, even the people who were hand in hand fighting for the Constitution during the federal convention did not have a shared understanding about how powerful the government was supposed to be or what it meant, that power. Um, and I, I'm sure I've, at, at this point, you know, given how between the classes I teach and I've been teaching them for decades and I've been doing this now for two years. And so some part of me is like, I've told this story before. So I, I should just issue a uniform. Like, I apologize if I've given this story before. But um, this is from a letter I found um, in the archives at, at the University of Virginia when I was a grad student there. And it involved, um, someone going to visit James Madison in his old age. Uh, and this person had heard that, um, and Hamilton is long gone by this point. Uh, this person had heard that one of Hamilton's sons was going to write a biography uh, of his father and claim in the biography that James Madison had abandoned Hamilton, that they had been friends and allies during the constitutional convention and Madison abandoned Hamilton. And the letter describes um, Madison's response, which gets at this idea that I'm, I'm pointing to about um, the fluidity of some of these ideas, and even people who thought they agreed didn't. Madison, um, actually, supposedly Madison first looked pained and said something like, you know, he is, like he's going to say that, which is kind of poignant. And then he said, um, I abandoned Hamilton. And then he paused and he said, Hamilton abandoned me by trying to administration the government into being something it was never intended to be. So essentially saying Hamilton tried to use the administrative apparatus of government to make the government stronger than it was intended to be at the beginning. So he, even though we agreed, we didn't because he was moving in a direction that, you know, was not where we started. He, his thinking was, was warped. So even those two who were like the supreme, you know, dynamic duo of trying to get the government to be stronger, 
they didn't necessarily agree. And of course, Madison does not end up being a federalist federalist of the of the 1790s, but still, I, I don't think there was huge agreement. I think the federalists, generally speaking, wanted that national government to really have power enough um, that it could compel some things on a state level because the states uh, by themselves, as, as I said earlier, Hamilton assumed states have all the power, right? States is where, that's where people are looking. That's where they feel that they belong to. National government has none. So of course it has to be super powerful because you know people aren't gonna ever really look to the national government first. So very, so the answer to how strong, was there a limit to how strong the federalists wanted the national government to be? Depended on the federalists you ask, but they sure did want it to be strong and were in favor of, you know, Hamilton particularly, you know, making it strong, strong, stronger. You know, he's the one who says whenever the government appears in public, it, it, it must be a Hercules, right? It need, the American people need to assume that, that the government is really, really strong. And you can do that by just looking strong, even if you aren't strong yet. Um, so, you know, obviously, I, I almost don't need to say this, but that's a huge part of the struggle in the 1790s over um, how small d democratic a nation this nation is gonna be. That's partly a matter of, of the American people and how they can um, engage in politics outside of elections. And that's partly a question of the power of the government um, and how that relates to the people uh, individually and uh, in, a, in a statewide kind of a way. Well, thank you. Um, and another question History-based question from Richard, what is your best sense of the overall active support for the revolution? And how were the divisions among the colonists carried over into the politics of the new republic? So there was, there was, I mean, this, I always feel like I'm saying these statements that are like, yeah, Joanne, tell us about it. I was about to say revolutions are complicated, <laughs> but they are, right? Because, um, and you can see this when you look at um, correspondence and diaries and things of people like going through the revolution. On the one hand, um, they have their beliefs uh, or they don't, right? They, they have some general ideas, but they aren't on a side. But in the course of being involved in a war, you sometimes have to take a side. And so you see um, families divided or um, people compelled to, to take a side. There's a, uh, a story about um, the Battle of New Haven during the revolution. Uh, in which there's a man whose uh, wife was ill and, and people in New Haven were fleeing, uh, but this man couldn't flee from the British, his wife was sick. And so when the British asked him, uh, are you for us or against us? And which side are you on? Um, he said, I'm with you because he wanted to protect his wife. Uh, but the community never forgave him for that, right? That, that well, then you're, you're with them. Um, so those kinds of divisions on the one hand were big, on the other hand, were suspicious because how do you, how do you know for sure, right? When people are, can be put in situations where they're compelled to, to sort of declare a side. That's why there were so many oaths, you know, people taking oaths of their loyalty or oaths of uh, who they supported. Uh, so there were a lot of divisions despite the fact that it was a war with a cause and the rage militaire. It's not as though there was a straight line in American society and everyone was on one side or another. Uh, and it, throughout the war, there were surprises, particularly for the British who assumed, uh, particularly in the South, that there'd be lots of people supporting them. And everyone would say, yeah, like people support you locally. And then they would get there. And <laughs> not only were there not a lot of supporters, but of people there who might've supported them were driven to the Patriot side because the British were so arrogant and, and nasty towards the Americans. So there are divisions, you know, I would say um, from the revolution, I, I don't think you could say that people who were Tories or loyalists in the revolution go on to automatically become X, Y, and Z. You could say, I suppose, that people who were loyalists during the revolution, some of them might have been um, merchants or would have been better off people who are of a sort who would go on to become Federalists, right? You know, you can look at Jefferson's correspondence and see all of the buzzwords he uses when he refers to Federalists. And it's always like money men, commerce men, paper men, you know, it, it's that kind of community. And I suppose you could say that there are some people uh, who 
during the revolution that might have pushed them in one direction because of, it affected trade with Britain. And then that might then afterwards push them in a particular direction because of the Federalists. So there are links, but um, I, you know, I say this all the time when I teach, there are no straight lines of politics. So you can't say people divided this way during the revolution and then they followed up you know, afterwards. In the same way that you can't say everyone who was an anti-Federalist during the constitutional debate becomes an anti-federalist or a Jeffersonian afterwards. Some do and some don't. You know, debates aren't identical. Um, so, you know, the, boy, the we gets really complicated when you start to get down on this level of, of, you know, who's going where, but which makes sense, right? Because some of this is circumstantial. Some of this is the moment you're in and the people you're among and the issues up for debate. Uh, and that's going to change your, how you understand your own identity, never mind your relation to others. I was just, um, Someone's gonna get bingo. Um, I was just talking about this um, yesterday when recording my podcast and um, I, I said something and actually one of the producers said this too um, about uh, considering whether you're an American Jew or a Jewish American um, and, and the difference that that makes. Uh, you know, I would say I'm a Jewish American um, if you say, if you feel that you're an American Jew, that's a different sensibility of, of sorts. Um, and those kinds of questions and those, those kinds of statements can have real meaning, right? So to me, I'm an, I'm a, um, Jewish American because I'm an American who is Jewish, but I'm an American. Um, but those are two, they're definitely two different we's, right? I feel really strongly a part of the Jewish community. Um, and I feel really, really, really strongly. Um, about being an American citizen who cares about the country. So um, I feel like I meandered all over the place on my answer to that question. But um, these are, these are these, the things that we're discussing here are partly about nationality and national identity and partly about personal identity too. Um, and so they're complicated uh, and they are really amorphous. Thank you. We have an interesting question from Melissa. How did the white male founders expect that their system would survive with only them included in the we? Well, I, you know, I think, um, I don't think, even Hamilton, I don't think thought that there was a little small group of we, you know, I mean, he thought, he did think as many elite did, white elite, that there would be a, a you know, a, an elite group of white men who would be the right people to rule. Um, so there's one we, right? We, the elite educated people should have power. Um, but even Hamilton, who really would have strengthened the government a lot more if he would have been able to, understood that um, in a republic, the people matter a lot. Uh, and so he would say, you know, if I could, I would do X, but I can't because that would not be Republican. Whereas what I'm suggesting here is Right, so I'm, you know, yeah, I'm pushing the government to be a lot stronger than it is, um, but it's still a republic because even though I want the president to be much stronger, Americans give him power and, and the power can be taken away. It's not a monarch, this is a republic. Um, so that's, that's a little fluid too, right? The, the question of um, how you give power, how that power is, is, can be taken away, but that's, that's part of the answer um, to that question. I'm, I'm, I'm peeking over at the chat. Um, I don't know what's going on over there. I lost track and now there's like Alice in Wonderland. Anyway, go ahead and ask, ask a question. We do and we, and we have lots of great questions. I'm trying to, trying to figure out where to go with it. Um, <clears throat> oh, this, this is interesting. As politicians have sought to obtain the opinions of constituents, how has polling evolved over our history and what sort of came before polling in terms of getting constituents views? Oh, that's really interesting, right? So that part of that involves where, um, something I mentioned, which is like public opinion matters, but how do you know what, who's the public and what they're thinking, right? And you don't have polling mechanisms of sorts. So how do you know, right? And so you do sit in taverns and like strike up conversations in the street and look to see the newspapers on mantle places and all of this other behavior. And because of that, if you do that and you report back that public opinion um, isn't what you want it to be, in one case, someone says to James Madison, like people are generally kind of happy with Hamilton's plan. Madison says, wrong public, <laughs> you talk to the wrong public, find a different public. Um, 
it, it's quite a while before you get like sophisticated polling mechanism. Uh, and, and what's interesting about that, I remember thinking about this when I was writing my last book because um, Benjamin Brown French, uh, who's like always the guy on the spot somehow, he's very early involved in um, the Telegraph. And I believe it's, I think it's the 1848 election, presidential election. I could get this wrong, but I think it's 1848 when the Telegraph first uh, can have an impact in some way because it can transmit, you know, what's happening at the polling places. Which now, you know, we it was a problem for us, right? On TV, you have people on the East Coast announcing what's happening, and is that going to sway what's happening on the West Coast? Like we think about that all the time. How media complicates elections, and how people are like don't announce anything early on, like wait till after whatever hour so you don't sway the other states. No polling, no real understanding in 1848 uh, about how people are gonna vote. So Benjamin Brown French was frantically writing to these telegraph offices and saying like, don't transmit results. Like don't, you know, we don't wanna mess up the election because we don't know how people are gonna vote. And if you go to the telegraph and say, here's what's happening here, then that will, essentially act as a poll, right? It'll be taken as data. Um, so polling is not a be all end all because now in a sense, we have so many polls. Certainly I find very often that I see the announcement of a poll and I have to like, who, who did the poll? Uh, what was the pool for the poll? How was the data collected? When was the date? You know, we, we are now sophisticated enough in um, our understanding of polling uh, that it becomes harder just to take polling data for granted. But before that, I suppose you were, elections had all that much more importance. Hamilton would say sometimes um, in uh, for, when he wanted to know how members of Congress felt about something, there's actually a letter in which he says, um, well, just like have a vote on something related to it and people will be forced to take sides because they'll be voting and then I'll know who's on our side. How else do you know, right? Um, at some point um, I, when I wrote about Actually, my first book, when I wrote about politics in this early period without absolute like party labels, uh, it, I talk about it as being a war without uniforms because people didn't necessarily always know how other people are going to vote. And in a sense, you know, without polling, there's a big unknown uh, when you're moving your way towards electoral contests of one kind or another. Um, so and that was something that had to be kind of grappled with. Uh, so polling isn't isn't the be all end all. I can say personal experience, my, my father was a market researcher uh, and he was constantly, you know, doing, um, sending out questionnaires to people who would watch movies. And then my brothers and I would get paid a dollar to sort the questionnaire. So, you know, I grew up like watching essentially polling happen. And I understood at a really early age that how you ask the question and what question you asked and where you were when you asked the question and your tone of voice when you asked the question, all the ways in which that could shape the outcome. Um, I don't know what that has done to me as a political historian, but uh, I definitely understood in a way that all of this polling and questionnaire stuff, on the one hand, it was useful. On the other hand, you know, <laughs> I don't know how trustworthy it always was. Anyway, I see that we're like already over time. Um, I'm, I like feel like I meandered all over the map today, but that's kind of where we takes us, right? All over the map. Um, I will say first off, um, thank you all as ever for joining us uh, on History Matters and So Does Coffee on Friday, a Friday morning. Thank you for engaging in democracy by having these kinds of discussions, which really matter. Um, the discussion we have as a whole, the discussion that's happily going on in chat as well. The fact that we are here and talking about these things and asking questions uh, and agreeing and disagreeing, that matters a lot, even if we don't always think it does. Also, uh, we are now going to segue to the after party. And what that means is that we will no longer be recording what's being said, and then we can be freer and easier uh, in the way that we chat about whatever the heck it is we want to chat about. Um, if you beamed in through NCHE, through their website, uh, just stay right where you are. Someone else is going to get bingo and poof, you will be in the after party in mere moments. If you are watching us through Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to ncheteach.org slash conversations. And then you too will poof, be in the after party with us. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I did not, I don't know if I got a chance to say happy Easter uh, and happy Passover to all who celebrate everything. Um, and Ramadan, I guess too, right? Happy everything uh, to everyone. 
Um, I wish you all uh, a wonderful weekend. And um, when I next see you, I will be 60 years old. <laughs> I said it out loud. I said it out loud. Uh, anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Have a wonderful week. Uh, and I may very well be talking about masculinity next week because that's a really interesting topic. So, okay, I turn things back to Grace. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, happy birthday, Joanne. And if you'd like to see um, more episodes like these or more content from NCHE, just go to nchteach.org um, slash conversations or nchteach.org for a variety of offerings we have. Um, and again, thank you for being here with us, Joanne. And we will now stop being live. <laughs> you said that so sadly. <laughs>